normal shocks, oblique shocks, and expansion waves rarely exist as isolated phenomena. Supersonic flows in channels or around objects create different combinations of these waves based on the shape of the solid surface they interact with. These waves will interact with themselves or even be reflected by walls. In this lesson, we will explore the details of wall reflections and wave interactions. So, let's get started. Let's consider a supersonic flow passing over an inclined wall. If the reflection is small enough, an attached oblique shock will form. Now, what if the deflection is inside a channel? The shock would reflect on the opposite wall, like a light ray will reflect on a mirror. This is uh, in order to straighten the flow and make it parallel to the top side again. The reflection will not be purely geometrical like the trajectory of a billiard ball bouncing off the wall, but it will be determined by the fluid conditions. Let's analyze this in detail. For convenience, divide the domain in three regions. Region 1 is upstream the first oblique shock. Region 2 is in between the two shocks and region 3 is behind the second oblique shock. The deflection corner theta 1 generates the shock wave A that has an angle beta 1 2. The flow changes direction and approaches the upper wall still at supersonic speed. From the point of view of the fluid, the upper wall is at an angle theta 2. Hence, the oblique shock B is generated. Past the shock, the flow is parallel to the upper wall. The deflection angles theta 1 and 2 are equal by geometrical considerations. The Mach number decreases as we move from region 1 to region 3. The static pressure, on the other hand, increases. Using the oblique shock relations, we can estimate these flow conditions. The strength of the reflection is given by the product of the individual shock strengths. Note that the variations across shock A and B, as well as the shock angles, will be different since the upstream Mach number is not the same. If the channel keeps converging, Additional reflections will occur until a normal shock forms and the flow becomes subsonic. This is called a regular reflection and the geometry is referred to as a supersonic diffuser, since the shocks slow down the flow and increase its pressure. This mechanism is used to design supersonic turbojet inlets in order to compress the air and make it subsonic before entering the combustor. Let's now look how we can analyze the reflections using the oblique shock relations. Assume that M1 and theta1 are known. Using the beta theta Mach relation, we can find the shock angle. Then, using the oblique shock relations, we can estimate M2. We know that in this case the second deflection angle theta2 is equal to theta1. So we can again use the beta theta Mach diagram to find the shock angle and then estimate the Mach number M3. Pass the shock. Once we know the Mach numbers and the wave angles, we can estimate the pressure and temperature ratios across the shocks using the oblique shock relations. And finally, calculate the overall pressure and temperature ratio across the two shocks. You can try out the example in the handout to test this out. 
If you find that the Mach number increases across the shock or the pressure decreases, double check your calculations. Now, what if the solution for the oblique shock does not exist? If the deflection angle for the reflected wave is larger than the maximum angle for the flow's Mach number, a curved strong shock will form at the wall and intersect the oblique shock. The reflected shock is curved. This condition is called Mach reflection. A streamline passing through point A forms a slip line downstream from point A. A slip line is a streamline across which the pressure is continuous, while all the other thermodynamic properties are discontinuous. On the top side of this slip line, the flow is subsonic, since it goes through a strong shock, while below it, the flow is still supersonic. Let's now analyze another peculiar case. If the flow behind the oblique shock does not have to be turned in order to be parallel to the wall, then we can have a wave cancellation. The shock will not reflect at all on the wall. This can be a useful consideration to remove shock waves in supersonic channel flows. Shocks are not the only ones that can reflect on walls. Expansion waves can do that as well. The reflected waves are new expansion waves. The overall effect of the reflection is to accelerate further the flow and reduce its pressure. This effect can be used to accelerate the flow passing through a supersonic nozzle. Let's now look at shock waves interactions. What happens when two or more shocks collide? Let's find out. If we have a segmented wall, at each corner a new shock wave will be produced. These waves will be eventually colliding and form a stronger shock. The upstream condition of the flow will govern the point of intersection and the strength of the shocks. At the intersection point, a slip line will form along with a weak reflective wave. A different kind of interaction happens when the shock waves come from different directions. Let's look at a channel with two opposing deflection corners. The shocks generated by the corners interact and form two new shocks with different strengths and a slip line. The point of intersection and the shock angles depend on the upstream Mach number. The flow direction past the intersection point is the same and parallel to the slip line. It is possible to estimate the shock angles and the flow properties past the intersection based on what we know about the slip line. The direction of the flow and the pressure must be the same above and below the slip line. Hence, one can guess the flow direction then estimate the deflections of the flow and using the oblique shock relations, calculate the pressure around the slip line. The final solution is obtained once the same value of pressure is found above and below the slip line. In this lesson, we explored what wave reflections and wave interactions are, and we discussed different ways to analyze them.